Hi there. Good distinctions are the spice of life. Welcome to Will Wright Catholic. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. And if you're joining us again, welcome back. It's wonderful to have everyone here. If you haven't yet subscribed to Will Wright Catholic, you can go to willwrightcatholic.com and sign up there on Substack. Or you can uh, follow on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. If this episode or any of the other episodes you've listened to have been a blessing to you, if you've enjoyed them, if you think other people should hear them, please take a moment to rate and review. Uh, leave a message about the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify especially, that would be wonderful. And if you're listening on YouTube, same thing. Please hit the bell for notifications after you subscribe and uh, share it with your friends and family. It'd mean a lot to me. That's uh, really the only way I have to share this other than, you know, just the basic social media things of my own. So <clears throat> today we're looking at the question of religious freedom. A lot of people have an idea of what they think this is, uh, but I think the church has a very clear view of what religious freedom is. So that's what we're going to look at today, as well as what does the United States have to say. And I'm, I'm coming from a particularly American perspective, because I am in the United States and am an American citizen. So I know that we have listeners currently in 23 different countries. So if this doesn't fit your experience exactly, at least you'll know a bit more about the American situation. But like I say, in the end of today's episode, we're going to be diving into just what does the Catholic Church have to say about religious freedom. So without further ado, let's dive into the topic of religious freedom. So if you ask the average American on the street what religious freedom is, you're going to get all sorts of different ideas. Some places you'll hear, hey, keep your religion to yourself. Haven't you heard of separation of church and state? Others might answer you, people are free to believe whatever they want. Who am I to judge if they're right or not? Who's to say? Who's to say? Still others might claim that religious freedom means the ability to privately say and pray however you want. But none of these are what religious freedom is actually is specifically. should also be noted that the American constitutional notion of religious freedom is not precisely what the Catholic Church holds religious freedom to be. And so the object of today's exploration is to look at what religious freedom is in the United States of America, and then more importantly, in my, my view, to view what religious freedom is in principle as defined by the Catholic Church and expressed most recently in the Second Vatican Council. So first, this idea of separation of church and state, what is that? Well, let's start with the First Amendment. The First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, the first of the Ten Amendments, which comprom uh, comprise rather the Bill of Rights, adopted on December 15, 1791, reads like this. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And just to give the full context, I'll read the rest of the amendment. Or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of people peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So if you'd like to learn more about freedom of speech, we did cover that earlier in the podcast uh, on are there limits to free speech. Uh, so definitely check that out. But for our purposes, we're going to focus on this first phrase. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. This is known as the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. So when, I'm, when I say Establishment Clause throughout today's episode, that's what I'm referring to, this idea that the government shall, not, uh, shall have no law respecting an establishment of religion. So I don't really have time or space here to provide an exhaustive account of American jurisprudence on the matter of religious liberty. I also don't have a law degree. I haven't studied the law uh, in, a, in a very, very deep way, uh, I, in a sufficient way to, to really remark with authority, um, but pretty decent researcher. So hopefully I can draw out some key moments in American history where this question has come up, and it'll give us a clearer view of what religious freedom is according to uh, the general consensus of the United States really has expressed through the Supreme Court decisions over the last couple hundred years. But where did this, this idea of the separation between church and state come from? And that really comes in a letter to the Danbury Baptist from Thomas Jefferson, the president at the time in the early 1800s, uh, elected in 1800. He says, gentlemen, 
and it's the longer quote, but it's worth reading. Gentlemen, the affectionate sentiments of esteem and approbation with which you are so good as to express towards me on behalf of the Dan Danbury Baptist Association give me the highest satisfaction. My duties dictate a faithful and zealous pursuit of the interests of my constituents, and in proportion as they are persuaded of my fidelity to those duties, to discharge them, the discharge of them becomes more and more pleasing. Believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that le the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people, which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Adhering to this expression of the supreme will of the nation in behalf of the rights of conscience, I shall see with sincere satisfaction the progress of those sentiments which tend to restore to man all his natural rights, convinced he has no natural right in opposition to his social duties. I reciprocate your kind prayers for the protection and blessing of the common father and creator of man, and tender you for yourselves and your religious association assurances of my high respect and esteem." Now, he wrote this letter in response to a letter from the Danbury Baptists in order to explain his views of federalism and the meaning of the Establishment Clause, which he brings up in the letter. And the main meaning of his, of this wall of separation between church and state, is an assurance that the government would not interfere with the church of the Danbury Baptists or give special treatment to any particular religion or sect. Justice Hugo Black, an appointee of Franklin Roosevelt to the Supreme Court, would later even refer to this Danbury explanation as, as he says, an almost authoritative declaration, end quote, of the founder's intent for the Establishment Clause. Two days after sending this letter, though, Jefferson attended a religious service in the House of Representatives located in the Capitol building. As Daniel Rober uh, notes, he says, Jefferson and others recognized the benefits of developing a national identity that transcended interdenominational division. Yet since 1990, or 1795, public worship was administered at the partially completed Capitol building each Sunday at noon. Now, religious liberty was the motivation of the Plymouth Pilgrims and many Catholics who settled in Maryland. However, the colonial period was far from united on religious matters. Protestant sects disagreed amongst themselves. Catholics were seen as untrustworthy papists of low social stature. Jewish people were tolerated at best. Really, the nation country needed an identity which transcended these divisions. The importance of developing a national identity was something that would really take over 100 years more as most identified with most readily with their own state. Right? So there wasn't like uh, this thought of people saying, well, I'm an American. No, they would be, I'm a North Carolinian, or I'm a Virginian, or I'm a New Yorker, things like this, first and foremost. So from there, let's, let's get forward a little bit to 1971. In that year, a case was brought to the Supreme Court in which the court considered whether a law in Pennsylvania violated the Establishment Clause. And this was uh, Lemon v. Kurtzman and the three-prong test, as it would come to be called. The law reimbursed religious schools with state funds for textbooks and salaries for teachers for non-public, non-secular schools. The court responded to this eight to zero with a three-prong test for determining whether a given statute is constitutional. And they basically put it this way. Said, they said the government may assist religion only if, one, the primary purpose of the assistance is secular, two, the assistance must neither promote nor inhibit religion, and three, there is no excessive entanglement between church and state. So in this specific case, the Pennsylvania law was struck down because of excessive entanglement between church and state. And it's worth noticing here what's implicit. There's nothing wrong in the American understanding with some implicit entanglement between church and state. The issue ultimately is when this line is crossed toward what the court determines as excessive. Then in 1983 in Marsh v. Chambers, the Nebraska legislature opened each of its sessions with a publicly funded chaplain offering a prayer. 
And in the Supreme Court case of Marsh v. Chambers, again, 1983, they determined that this was not a violation of the Establishment Clause. Though this instance does not pass the lemon test or the three-prong test, the justice argued that there's a long historical custom going back to the Continental Congress and the very Congress that resulted in the Bill of Rights. In the majority opinion, Chief Justice Warren Burger wrote this. He says, in light of the unambiguous and unbroken history of more than 200 years, there can be no doubt that the practice of opening legislative sessions with prayer has become part of the fabric of our society. To invoke divine guidance on a public body entrusted with making the laws is not, in these circumstances, an establishment of religion or a step toward establishment. It is simply a tolerable acknowledgement of beliefs widely held among the people of this country. So as we saw with the Capitol building services in the time of Jefferson, there is a, there's not a strict and non-transversible wall of separation of church and state. Now, I want to walk through several other Supreme Court cases that touched on religious liberty. And again, this lot list isn't exhaustive, but it can help us round out our picture. Uh, in 1879, in Reynolds v. United States, the court upheld a federal law banning polygamy, uh, which was something that was part of the Mormon religion early on. They claim that the free exercise clause of the First Amendment forbids government from regulating belief, but that government can nonetheless punish acts which it judges to be criminal, regardless of religious belief. In uh, 1961, and the state, of, uh, the state of Maryland had a requirement that a candidate for public office needed to declare that they believed in God in order to be eligible for the position. Unanimously, in Torcaso v. Watkins, the court agreed that this gives preference to believers who were willing to publicly profess. Therefore, Maryland was aiding theistic religions and beliefs over atheistic ones. Uh, and so that was struck down as unconstitutional. Uh, in the 1962 case, Engel v. Vitale, the court ruled six to one that a New York prayer to begin the school day was unconstitutional and in violation of the Establishment Clause bec uh, despite being a non-denominational prayer. So this, again, was going towards this idea of establishing a religion. In uh, the following year, in 1963, the court heard the case of Abington v. Shemp and the related case of Murray v. Curlett. In both cases, public schools were involving students in daily Bible readings and in the latter case of the daily recitation of the Lord's Prayer. Again, this is in public schools. Both of these cases were seen as violating both the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment. In 1972, Amish parents sued the state of Wisconsin in the case Wisconsin v. Yoder uh, for requiring that their children attend school until the age of 16. The unanimous decision held that the Amish teens were exempt from the state law of requiring 14 to 16 year olds to attend school because the Amish religion required a living apart from worldly influences. In other words, though it was in the state's interest that the children receive two more years of schooling, this did not outweigh the free exercise of the religion of the Amish. Uh, in 1978, in McDaniel v. Patey, a Tennessee law barring clergymen from serving in public office was challenged. The court unanimously decided that or ruled that this law was a violation of the free exercise clause of the First Amendment as well as the 14th Amendment because it made holding public office contingent on surrendering religious beliefs. So the court was saying that's a no-go. You can't tell people, you can't have a religious test. You can't have people surrender their religious beliefs before taking public office uh, or serving as a judge for that matter. In 1993, the court heard the, the case of the Church of Lukumi uh, Babalu Ai, I have no idea if I pronounced that right, uh, versus the city of Hialeah. Uh, there were ordinances passed by that city in Florida that banned animal sacrifice. These laws were not written in a neutral and generally applicable way. They were specifically targeting Santeria, a Afro-Caribbean religion based on Yoruba and some Catholic elements. But because animal sacrifice is an important part of Santeria, the court ruled that the ordinances were designed as a form of religious persecution 
in violation of the free exercise clause. So even if it's something like banning animal sacrifice, it's because the law wasn't written in a neutral and generally applicable way. It was targeting one specific religion. Uh, in 2000, Santa Fe Independent School District of Texas v. Doe uh, had a, basically that school district had a policy permitting student-led, student-initiated prayer at football games. In a 6-3 to three decision, so this was not unanimous, but in a 6-3 to three decision, the court upheld an appellate court's ruling that this was a violation of the Establishment Clause. The school district tried to argue that because it was student-led and initiated, it was private speech and thus protected under the First Amendment. However, Justice John Paul Stevens argued that it was not private speech because it was done over the PA system by a student body representative under school faculty supervision and under school policy. Also, it didn't pass the lemon test because it didn't have a secular purpose and it was implemented with the purpose of endorsing school prayer. California's Elk Grove Unified School District v. Newdow in 2004 investigated the policy requiring each elementary school class to say the Pledge of Allegiance daily. Uh, Michael Newdow, a father of one of the students, challenged this because of the words therein contained of under God. So because Newdow did not have custody of the child, he didn't have standing to bring the case to court. However, in concurring opinions, Justices William Rehnquist, Sandra Day O'Connor, and Clarence Thomas said that the words under God do not violate the Establishment Clause. As the Bill of Rights Institute reports, they say further, they noted the phrase under God in the pledge seems as a historical matter to sum up the attitude of the nation's leaders and to manifest itself in many of our public observances. Examples of patriotic invocations of God and official acknowledgments of religion's role in our nation's history abound. They concluded that the recital in a patriotic ceremony pledging allegiance to the flag and to the nation of the descriptive phrase under God cannot possibly lead to the, to the establishment of a religion or anything like it. And so the Pledge of Allegiance, even containing the words under God, is not a violation of the First Amendment. In a similar case in Van Orden v. Perry in 2005, in a 5-4 decision, the court determined that a monument inscribed with the Ten Commandments on Texas state capitol grounds did not violate the Establishment Clause. Now, this is because there was 38 other monuments on the grounds that highlighted different parts of Texan history. Justice William Rehnquist argued that the monument had a religious message, and it was presented in a context showing that a secular moral message about proper standards of social conduct and a message about the historical relation between those standards and the law. That, that's how it was presented in that context. Therefore, the religious message is part of a broader context of cultural heritage and patrimony of the people of Texas. And so just to round this off, I want to bring up three more Supreme Court cases, uh, sorry, two more, two more, um, that are, I think are worth looking at because they discuss the teaching of evolution in schools. So not particularly freedom of religion, but very much tied up in it. So generally, there's a, a perceived discrepancy of considerable magnitude between the theory of evolution, um, as put forward by especially secularist atheists, uh, and the evidence for creation from the book of Genesis. Now, I'm not trying to get into that minefield right now, but these cases show how religious liberty and the government of the United States interact, and so I think they're worth looking at. In Epperson v. Arkansas in 1968, Arkansas passed a law saying that the public school teachers were banned from teaching evolution because it was in contradiction with the Bible account of creation. Justice Abe Fortas wrote in the majority opinion saying, in the present case, there can be no doubt that Arkansas has sought to prevent its teachers from discussing the theory of evolution because it is contrary to the belief of some that the book of Genesis must be the exclusive source of doctrine as to the origin of man. No suggestion has been made that Arkansas law may be justified by considerations of state policy other than the religious views of some of its citizens. So he continued to argue that the law of Arkansas is clearly not a religiously neutral act. Instead, it's targeting a particular theory on biblical grounds, literally read. So therefore, it's a violation of the First and Fourteenth Amendments. 
19 years later, in Edwards v. Aguilard uh, in 1987, um, the court examined a Louisiana law forbidding the teaching of the theory of evolution in public schools unless it was accompanied by an equal treatment of creationism. In a 7-2 decision, uh, the court declared that this law violated the Establishment Clause because it failed all three parts of the Lemon Test. It lacked secular purpose, it endorsed the view that a supernatural being created mankind, and it entangled the interests of church and state by seeking to employ the symbolic and financial support of government to achieve a religious purpose. So if we're putting all this together, the evolution of religious liberty in the United States has its basis on the cultural milieu of the time. In the colonial period and in the early days of the country, there were very few true atheists. Deism was exceptionally popular, but even deists acknowledged a belief in the creator. So a non-denominational prayer to the creator at the state of a session of Congress was a foregone conclusion. It's going to happen. But since that time, the United States has become far more culturally, religiously, and politically diverse, for better or worse. And as a result of this undeniable diversity, it cannot be said that the United States is currently a Judeo-Christian nation, even if the case can strongly be made that it began that way. Private speech and religious practice is unambiguously protected. However, as, as we've seen walking through these examples, the nature of the public exercise of religion is questioned when public funds are in the mix. So each of the examples mentioned above, or mentioned uh, previously rather, and where problems usually arise is in publicly funded schools, government property or buildings, and in relation to public office. But the Supreme Court has upheld that religious beliefs, which are not criminal, are protected in the public sphere. So a religious person need not check the religion at the door when engaging in public matters. And, and how could they, really? You can't simply stop being who you are because you're in a different place. That would be uh, lacking integrity. That would be hypocritical. Uh, or like many of the Catholic politicians we have today, you're, you're Catholic in name only. When your practice is incredibly not Catholic. Uh, I could think here of, of Nancy Pelosi or Joe Biden or... Um, uh, there's a, a Ted Lieu from California. Uh, there's many others that claim to be Catholic, but in practice are just so not close to good Catholics in uh, Catholics in good standing with uh, solid practice of Catholic teaching in the public sphere, being very very pro pro abortion, pro euthanasia. Um, pro-gay marriage, pro all sorts of things that the church is very much opposed to on principle. So no, no, you cannot check your religion at the door when you're engaging in public matters if you wish to have integrity. And, you know, I think we should. I think that's virtuous. I think it's a good thing to have integrity. What do, what do people say when they leave the church? Oh, it's full of hypocrites. Well, maybe if we weren't hypocrites, overtly in public, it would be a little bit easier to, uh, to help people stay uh, in the church. Now, that's a really sh uh, shallow and shoddy excuse. Usually people leave for other personal reasons, and, and we pray and hope that they'll come back and we continue to reach out to them. But anyway, I'm getting a little afield of the episode here. The First Amendment of the Constitution protects all Americans against the establishment of any one religion to the competition or detriment of any others. Any law which would exclude a person from public life on the basis of religion is unconstitutional. And the free exercise of religion is safeguarded and held in a careful balance with the interests of all other religions, beliefs, and ideas. This reality is a blessing and a curse for Catholics. On the one hand, we have freedom to boldly speak the truth without fear of legal reprisals with undue limits in most cases. And yet, on the other hand, there's a bland tolerance of false religions and ideas antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ and his church. So all of that being said, what is the Catholic view of religious freedom? Is it precisely the American view or are there significant differences? Now, when I speak to American Catholics about this question, there's no real sense of a firm understanding of the church on the matter. And frankly, when people read the official church teaching, they don't understand the nuances offered there. So I'm going to do my best to help shed some light on the subject and hopefully draw out some good distinctions here because 
you know, as I say often, good distinctions are the spice of life. And I made that tagline for this podcast for a reason, because, you know, they are. I think sometimes we we fall into this trap where we say, oh, gosh, that looks like the church is teaching heresy, or it looks like the church is, is just giving in to modernism and the bland tolerance. Or on the other hand, that, that we're, oh, we're just too strict. Everybody's going to hell except for Catholics in good standing. Oh, my goodness. When really... We need to make good distinctions and calm down, take a breath, and, and find the truth in the middle and let Jesus speak to us through his church. And that's that's what I try to do. That's what I hope I can help, uh, help you do. So what we're looking at is the document of the Second Vatican Council promulgated by Pope St. Pius, or sorry, Pope St. Paul VI on December 7th, 1965. This is one of the 16 documents of the Second Vatican Council known as Dignitatis Humanae. It's only 15 paragraph sections long. It's highly worth reading in its entirety. You can find that link at willwritecatholic.com on this post. What I'll offer here is a brief summary and the main conclusions. And in interest of keeping this to the point, I'm going to be looking at three main questions. I'm not giving the whole document here, just three main questions. First, what is religious freedom in the eyes of the church? Two, why is religious freedom based on human dignity? Uh, There's other things we could base religious freedom on, but why did the Church Fathers of the Second Vatican Council uh, base it on human dignity? And then third, how has God revealed religious liberty? So that first question, what is religious freedom in the eyes of the Catholic Church? God has made himself known to man, shown us how we're to serve him, and how we are saved in Christ and come to eternal blessedness. The church unequivocally affirms in Dignitatis Humanae that, in paragraph one, we believe that this one true religion subsists in the Catholic and apostolic church, to which the Lord Jesus Christ committed the duty of spreading it abroad among all men. Thus he spoke to the apostles, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have enjoined upon you. Now, many of those who are suspicious of the Second Vatican Council read this, not as the full-throated profession of Christ and his church that it is. Instead, they read the word subsist in an uncharitable and ignorant way. We could say that the one true religion is the Catholic and apostolic church, but subsists is actually a richer word. Subsist means to begin in a certain way and remain in that way. Now, why is that important? Well, there's a lot of Protestants, especially going around saying that there was a great apostasy that happened around the time of um, Emperor Constantine. Right? And only recently, under the, the Reformation in the 1500s and after, did we reclaim what the church is. And so to say that the one true religion is the Catholic and Apostolic Church, a Protestant could finish that statement and say, The one true religion is the Catholic and Apostolic Church, which began by Jesus Christ and fell away in a great apostasy in the 300s and was reclaimed sometime later. See, by saying subsists, we're saying that it begins in a certain way and remain that way. In other words, there is no true religion apart from the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church of Jesus Christ, as our Lord began it and has constantly sustained it to this day, the church, which of course is his own mystical body. It's a divine act constituting his own body, enlivened by his spirit to the glory of the Father, and we are brought into that reality through baptism. And so I I don't see a problem with this word subsists. So we believe that this one true religion subsists in the Catholic and Apostolic Church. Amen. Okay, we'll go on. The Council Fathers continue. On their part, all men are bound to seek the truth, especially in what concerns God and his church, and to embrace embrace the truth they come to know and to hold fast to it. So elsewhere in Vatican II in the documents Lumen Gentium and Ad Gentes, we hear this. This is from Lumen Gentium, paragraph 14. Whosoever, and and pay attention to this, because this is language that you don't often hear when we hear the Second Vatican Council. Okay, but, but this is from Vatican II. Whosoever, therefore, knowing that the Catholic Church was made necessary by Christ, would refuse to enter or to remain in it, could not be saved. The bonds which bind men to the Church in a visible way are profession of faith, the sacraments, and ecclesiastical government and communion. He is not saved, however, who, though part of the body of Christ, does not persevere in charity. 
He remains indeed in the bosom of the church, but as it were, only in a bodily manner and not in his heart. So for those who claim that Vatican II is weak on doctrine and the truth and is overly ambiguous and some other such nonsense, it's abundantly clear that they have never read the documents or that they've read them in an uncharitable and ignorant way. Now, I am I'm very, very open about the fact that I think that liberal theologians, and I don't mean that in the American term of political term, I mean liberal as in liberal tenet, liberalism of reading church teaching in a discontinuity or a, continu- a hermeneutic of rupture, uh, as Pope Benedict put it, or Ratzinger put it, um, I think they read it in an uncharitable way as well. They take this and they go a different direction with Vatican II and and make up all sorts of things. And I think both sides, both extremes are wrong. We need to read it for what it says. Right? Those who know that the church was made necessary by Christ, refuse to enter and remain in it, cannot be saved. Those who are in the church um, but do not persevere in charity, in other words, fall into mortal sin and do not repent, are in the bosom of the church only bodily and not in its heart, will not be saved. Another will go to hell unless they repent. So I think all of this matters that we, we really understand that the church is saying we, have a, we are bound to seek the truth and to adhere to it. And ultimately that means to Christ. At any rate, all of this being said, what is religious freedom? Well, the council fathers write this. Religious freedom, in turn, which men demand as necessary to fulfill their duty to worship God. So I'm going to pause there for a moment. What's religious freedom for? It is necessary to fulfill their duty to worship God. It is a freedom for worshiping God. Okay. Religious freedom, in turn, which men demand as necessary to fulfill their duty to worship God, has to do with immunity from coercion in civil society. That's it. That's the key right there. Therefore, it leaves untouched traditional Catholic doctrine on the moral duty of men and societies toward the true religion and toward the one church of Christ. Now, again, this is from Dignitatis Humanae 1, paragraph 1. Religious freedom, in turn, which men demand is necessary to fulfill their duty to worship God, has to do with immunity from coercion in civil society. Therefore, it leaves untouched traditional Catholic doctrine on the moral duty of men and societies towards the true religion and toward the one church of Christ. So the moral duty of man towards the Catholic church remains untouched by religious freedom. What's vital to understand the church's view is that phrase, immunity from coercion in civil society. That's the key. A more substantial definition is then given with very official verbiage in paragraph two saying this, this Vatican council declares that the human person has a right to religious freedom. This freedom means that all men are to be immune from coercion on the part of individuals or of social groups and of any human power, in such wise that no one is to be forced to act in a manner contrary to his own beliefs, whether privately or publicly, whether alone or in association with others, within due limits. Now, the church has always held this doctrine. We know, for example, that the church has always condemned forced conversions as illegitimate and compelled baptisms as invalid. As St. John Paul II often said, the faith is always proposed, not imposed. So next, why is religious freedom based on human dignity? This right to religious freedom, very clearly in Dignitatis Humanae, is rooted in human dignity. The church even calls for this right to be enshrined in constitutional law throughout the world. Our human dignity points to the fact that God endowed man with reason and free will and therefore with personal responsibility. We are impelled by human nature and bound by moral obligation to see the truth, especially seek the truth, especially religious truth. Once we know the truth, we're bound to adhere to it and order our lives towards it. The church declares that religious freedom is thus necessary because, as it says in paragraph two, men cannot discharge these obligations in a manner in keeping with their own nature unless they enjoy immunity from external coercion as well as psychological freedom. Because frankly, there's no love without freedom. There's no seeking of the truth without freedom. So religious freedom does not belong to feelings and subjective disposition. It belongs to the very nature of the human person. Because faith comes from what is heard, and truth is discovered 
And as truth is discovered, it is by a personal assent that men are to adhere to it, to use another phrase from Dignitatis Humanae. Personal though this assent is, religious freedom also extends to religious communities. They shouldn't be hindered. As it says in paragraph four, they shouldn't be hindered either by legal measures or by administrative action on the part of the government in the selection, training, appointment, and transferal of their own ministers, in communicating with religious authorities and communities abroad, in erecting buildings or for religious purposes, and in the acquisition and use of suitable funds or properties. Nor should they be hindered from public teaching and witness of faith, whether spoken or written. As the preeminent religious community, all of these freedoms belong to the family as well, as a, as a small community, as a, a local community of believers. And then finally, how has God revealed religious liberty? Well, in divine revelation, the doctrine of religious liberty finds its roots. The, tr the Council Fathers write this in paragraph 9. They say, Revelation does not indeed affirm in so many words the right of man to immunity from external co coercion and re matters religious. It does, however, disclose the dignity of the human person in its full dimensions. So first and foremost, man's response to God and faith must be free for it to be legitimate. No one can be forced to be Catholic. The act of faith is a free act. Because forcing someone to love is not love at all. As Dignitatis Humanae states in paragraph 10, it's therefore completely in accord with the nature of faith that in matters religious, every manner of coercion on the part of men should be excluded. In consequence, the principle of religious freedom makes no small contribution to the creation of an environment in which men can without hindrance be invited to the Christian faith embrace it of their own free will, and profess it effectively in their whole manner of life. So God is very clear, however, in what he has revealed, that we are to boldly proclaim the truth. Therefore, are we to be tolerant and accepting of other religions and simply have a bland indifference? Well, absolutely not. In, in Vatican II, in Dignitatis Humanae, the Council Fathers write in paragraph 14, the disciple is bound by grave obligation toward Christ his master, ever more fully to understand the truth received from him, faithfully to proclaim it, and vigorously to defend it. Never be it understood having recourse to means that are incompatible with the spirit of the gospel. At the same time, the charity of Christ urges him to love and have prudence and patience in his dealings with those who are in error or in ignorance with regard to the faith. Because again, as St. John Paul II said, the faith must always be proposed, not imposed. And so freedom from coercion in religious matters is the crux of the church's view of religious liberty. Really, it pertains directly to the establishment of an environment in which a person may freely seek and adhere to the one true religion. Though there are elements of truth outside the visible bounds of the Catholic Church, there is no salvation. If someone outside the visible bounds of the Church is saved, it is only by the superabundant merits of Jesus Christ and the instrumentality of the Catholic Church, the sacrament of salvation. And that's probably another podcast episode in the future that I can go into that more in detail. We must not be indifferent. Right? As Dignitatis Humanae even says, we must boldly preach the truth at all times. And we must not be afraid to stand up for those beliefs, even when it's inconvenient. In some contexts, doing so can even lead to our bodily martyrdom. In the United States of America, the constitutional order is more or less compatible with the free practice of the Catholic religion, at least at the time that I'm recording this. However, we must be cognizant that there is a distinct difference between religious freedom in the American idea and the Catholic teaching. See, the American notion protects us to an extent, but it's more geared to creating a national identity that transcends religion. And this should make any faithful Catholic nervous because it's working. How many American Catholics do you know, not people on the news, but people that you know, who are more concerned about being American Catholics than being Catholics who happen to be American. Just think about that. Freedom of religion, religious freedom, is freedom from coercion. Ultimately, is freedom for the truth, for the Catholic faith. 
And we cannot forget this, lest we descend into a banal coexistence or tolerance without the drive to share the fullness of the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. And woe to us if we do not preach the gospel. We cannot be indifferent and we cannot be content to allow anyone to stay in error. We cannot force them. We must respect their right to religious freedom by not coercing them and respecting their journey in good conscience. But the task and privilege of evangelization remains in full force. And so I end today very clearly. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever and forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so if anyone says to you, you know, hey, there's a separation of church and state, you tell them, actually, go listen to Will Wright Catholic, because uh, I just heard this great podcast that shows how uh, the American version doesn't quite get it right of what it actually is in our nature. So I hope this has been a help to you. I know um, even for myself going through this, I didn't really learn anything new in this. Um, there was a couple of things that I didn't know about in the Supreme Court cases, but you know, it's good to review this stuff. It's good to know exactly where we stand. I think even sometimes for those of us who are trying so hard to be faithful Catholics, we can get into this rhythm where we sort of believe the lies we hear in society. Or, oh, yeah, we don't want to be pushy. We want to be tolerant. We want to coexist with those around us. And, you know, to some extent, fine. But no, not, a, not if it's at the expense of the gospel. Because every single person in front of us, every person in our lives has a right to hear the gospel, has a right to have the gospel proclaimed to them. And so they have a right to religious freedom. They have a freedom co from coercion. But they also have a right to hear what Jesus Christ has to say to them and for them. And uh, that's through us sometimes. You and I might be the only person in the lives of those around us to proclaim the gospel. Because maybe you have Protestant brothers and sisters um, around you. Maybe, maybe your own family members are Protestant. And uh, you can continue to share the faith with them and, and pray and hope that they will come to the fullness of of the unity that is in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church of Jesus Christ. But we also have this other reality around us of a largely pagan culture, right? Pagan, um, pagan in that it really isn't Judeo-Christian. It really isn't uh, theistic in the sense of an organized religion or even a disorganized non-denominational experience, right? It's, it's people who don't go to church at all. They're, they're seeking truth in their own way, but my goodness, they're lost adrift. They're, they're worshiping nature and science in some ways. Um, they're worshiping government in some sense. And uh, so there's a lot of dangerous things out there, a lot of landmines. And so this idea of separation of church and state, mm, uh, no, we need to get that one right. We need to boldly proclaim the gospel, even in the public sphere. Do so with prudence, do so with love and charity always, and with patience. Be patient. I mean, don't expect people to convert overnight. And also remember, the Holy Spirit is the one who converts, not us. Um, anyway, this has already been a long enough episode, so I'm going to cut it short here. But, you know, pr please keep listening. Pray for, uh, pray for me, um, especially as I continue to create these, these uh, episodes. Uh, I'm really enjoying it. I hope you are too. I hope you're getting something out of it and they're inspired. And uh, please, please share it with uh, your friends and family if it has been a blessing to you. Um, this is all for the glory of Jesus Christ. And uh, I just, I want people to know these things because I think it's so empowering to, to know what Jesus actually wants to share with us, both from his own words and ac actions, but also through his church and uh, all to his greater glory. So have a wonderful day and uh, tune in next time. God bless.